Awesome, let's start with a quick survey. I would like to see a show of hands of how many of you work remotely full time? Wow, not that many. How many of you work in an office full time? That's more. And how many of you fall in between? You work in an office and some days you work from home. Oh, that's the majority of you. Interesting, how many of you would like to work remotely full time? <laughs> oh my God, not that many, that's surprising. Cool, today I'm going to share my experience with remote work. I'm not going to talk to you about the pros and cons of remote work or try to convince you that you should all start working remotely. I'm just going to share some of the challenges I had and the things that worked for me. Or how did I survive this massive remote work experiment that was forced upon us all by the pandemic? And what are the reasons I chose to continue it past the lockdown? But before I start, let me just tell you a little bit more about who I am. My name is Laura. I'm from Bulgaria, which is a country in Europe. And I moved to Wellington from Berlin, Germany in 2018 with my husband and our son. So that was about two and a half years ago. I'm a senior product engineer at Kogo. Kogo is a platform that uses open banking API, sustainability data and behavioral science to empower people to align their spending with their values. My team is currently uh, building uh, APIs, which allow our large partners to enable their users to allow their spending with their environmental and social values. Yes, we are growing fast and we are hiring again, so if sustainability or serverless is your thing, please check out our open roles or come talk to me uh, during the breaks. Now, back to remote work. Oops. My first experience with remote work was about 10 years ago. Uh, back then, I was living in Denmark. I was a freelancer, and most of my clients allowed me to do my work wherever I wanted, which is quite unusual uh, for that time. And I really struggled. I was young, I had no kids, no responsibilities, probably plenty of free time, and I had no idea what to do with it. And that was pretty much me most days, trying to work from the couch, which was not really working. I was just like not, not motivated. Probably the projects I was uh, working on were not really uh, challenging enough for me. I don't know, it was just not working. I tried uh, working at cafes, I tried going to the library. It was like, just so hard. Uh, Co-working spaces were not really a thing back then. So I, I really, really struggled. And eventually I started asking my clients if I can work in their offices. I had no other choice. Then, over the years, I established better habits. I learned how to manage my um, time effectively, and I started working from home a day or two a week. I learned that open plan offices are generally noisy, and I learned that I need a quiet environment to be effective. So working from home in the middle of the week was the thing that really helped me keep my sanity. It was my focus uh, daytime, the day that I could really concentrate, focus on my work and be productive. Then eventually, over the years, I started thinking that, well, yeah, I would like to start working remotely one day. I, I guess the idea of being a digital nomad really appe was appealing to me because I really love traveling. But at the same time, I was not really sure that it would work for me. I didn't know whether I would manage to be motivated and productive if I worked remotely full time. And so fast forward to 2020, the longest year in history. <laughs> the year started like most other years, as far as I'm concerned. People were talking about new virus, like this happens every year. And, but then as time passed, people were just talking more and more about this new virus. And I was kind of like not taking it seriously. I, I'm, I don't have a TV, I don't watch news. So when I say people, it was just people around me. And I'm like, oh, it's, you know, like the news, they always try to exaggerate things and talk about all this neg negative stuff. So I was like, no, that's nothing serious. And then I remember it was the 11th of March and I read on Twitter that the World Health Organization has declared an official pandemic. And I thought, wow, that seems really serious. 
And suddenly there was all this uncertainty and anxiety. I remember I was thinking like, what is going to happen now? Like, am I going to get sick? What will happen if I get sick? Will other people get sick because of me? I don't want other people to get sick because of me. I started washing my hands very often. I learned how to wash my hands properly. I became paranoid about touching my face. I was really worried about my family and friends back in Europe. And so naturally, a couple of days after the pandemic was declared, I started working from home full time. And then the lockdown was announced. We were told to remain in our bubbles. Schools and other educational facilities closed on the 24th of March. And at midnight on the 25th of March, New Zealand moved to alert level four. The entire country went into self-isolation. So yeah, things escalated pretty quickly, but think about it. Schools were to remain closed for at least four weeks. And when you have young children, that's like eternity, honestly. Like, really, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah. This uh, photo is taken before the lockdown. My now six-year-old son, Luke, is getting ready for school. So I was thinking, how am I going to work from home, homeschool, and generally survive being locked down in a house with this child <laughs> and my husband? It's just like, no. But I told myself, just, you know, be positive, be positive. It's going to be all right. Keep calm. And so it started. Day one, everything was amazing. Thank you, Reading X. For those of you that don't have children or don't know what Reading X is, it's an online reading program that helps children learn to read. And it's highly addictive. So over the next few days, Luke got completely addicted to Reading X completing level, le level after level. And he actually had his reading uh, graduation last week. Apparently, he finished the gazillion hours of lessons. I don't know how that's possible, but true story. But meanwhile, work. Work really changed. It was in the beginning, it was not that much about work. It was more about learning where my colleagues worked, who, uh, where they lived who they lived with, how are they coping with this new situation. Because, you know, we were all in this together. It was not unusual for a work meeting to be interrupted by kids or pets or neighbors mowing their lawns or people cutting trees. And my favorite one, my son screaming on top of his lungs from the toilet while I was in a meeting with an external stakeholder. Mom, please wipe my bum. <laughs> Just, yeah, the joys of having a child. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. I was privileged to have a dedicated home office, whereas others had to work from their dining rooms, their bedrooms, or the only room with a lock in the house, the bathroom. Video calls became the new normal, and not only for work. Zoom yoga classes, online meetups, virtual donuts, virtual networking, virtual conferences, virtual everything. Suddenly, there were so many things that I could do online from the comfort of my own home. I would start my day with an online dance class, have video work calls throughout the day, video networking, during my lunch breaks, online meetups in the evenings, every now and again, I would attend some virtual conference. And to top this all up, I was uh, doing virtual mentorship every other week. I, honestly, I don't know how I found the time for all these things. I don't know. And I was trying to be really positive and make the most out of this new situation. At home, we were having wild home discus parties, camping in the lounge, and we were baking a lot. Being in a lockdown with a young child was really hard. But I really enjoyed our new daily rituals. Going on walks in our beautiful neighborhood in the afternoons, throwing rocks in the river, and finishing the day watching cartoons. But I was also really craving me time. I felt like I won a million dollars 
from the lottery every time it was my time to go shopping. <laughs> yes, the joys of going out of the house by myself, to wait in a line, social distancing for an hour, just to find the empty shelves in the supermarket. Oh, that's priceless. <laughs> and to be honest, homeschooling was not great, going great at all. I tried to make sense of the homeschooling program that uh, Look School provided, but working full time and trying to homeschool at the same time, no, it was just not working. It was so stressful. Eventually, I gave up. It was, it was not just stressful for me, it was stressful for everyone. And somehow we managed, nevertheless. Most days I had no idea what my son was up to, but honestly, <laughs> like, he never ran out of ideas, like never. <laughs> and he even started cooking. <laughs> yes, I was trying to look on the bright side of things, trying to find something positive each day, even if some days I had to look a little harder, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. I was the positive person that was trying to keep everyone optimistic. I was not letting myself think about all the uncertainty. I was not going to let the anxiety kick in. No, that was just not me. And then one day, out of the blue, as I was chilling on the couch and enjoying the beautiful view out of my lounge window, my heart started racing and I could hardly breathe. I experienced my first panic attack. It's probably the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I was so focused on participating, connecting, and helping others that I forgot about my own needs. I forgot that I was also living in a pandemic. I didn't know when I'll be able to see my uh, family in Bulgaria, and I sti still don't know. The Zoom, the Zoom fatigue took over. I was dreading the video calls, so I just really needed a break. So I, I canceled all virtual networking calls. I stopped attending online meetups. I just stopped thinking about what is best for others. I slowed down. Luckily, schools reopened sometime in May, and Luke started going back to school. But being around people after so long felt really strange. Like, should I keep social distance? How close can I get to them? Can we shake hands? Oh, it's like the post-lockdown post was stressful in its own way. So I just continued working remotely. During these 33 days of lockdown, I had the opportunity to reflect on the things that really mattered to me on what I want for my, myself, my family, my friends, what I want for my professional life. I really enjoyed not being in a hurry to get somewhere and having more time to enjoy the things that are actually important to me. I improved my rela relationship with my child, like he even started eating broccoli. <laughs> and I was really enjoying not having to spend time commuting, not being uh, so driven by outside schedules, meant that I could let my son sleep in in the morning and start my day in peace. I had the opportunity to get the full-on remote working experience, and I learned that I can manage my time effectively, I can be motivated and productive, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed working remotely. And honestly, like nothing can beat a 20 minute power nap during my lunch break when I'm feeling tired. So I'm not giving up this, no. But after some time, I started noticing signs of burnout. And having experienced a serious burnout years ago, I knew the warning signs. The World Health Organization describes burnout as a syndrome which is the result from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It's characterized by three dimensions. So first is feeling of energy depletion or exhaustion. Second is increased mental distance from one's job or feeling of negativism related to one's job. And the third one is reduced professional efficacy. I was working four days a week trying to squeeze in five days worth of 
work into my four working days. I was just pushing myself too hard. And there was something else was going at work. A lot of my teammates' working hours were really drastically reduced. Some of them were working only two days a week. And I was feeling really bad for them, because most of them were people who were generally were earning less than me, and now they had to live off less than half of their weekly pay. And I was still getting my full wage, so I was feeling, starting to feel really guilty about this. I, I was really unhappy about the situation, and I could notice that I was getting negative and I was starting to distance myself from everything. My immune system got really weak and I started getting sick. So I knew that it was time for me to move on before it got worse, like it did years ago. Luckily, sometime in the middle of 2020, the job market woke up and some interesting roles were advertised. And there were more and more companies that were offering remote, uh, remote opportunities. And more companies were uh, also off open to remote interviewing, which was really helpful for me. So soon I found a role that I was really interested in. And Kogu's headquarters are here, here in Wellington, but they were happy for me to work remotely and only come to the office once every quarter. So initially, I was planning to work in the office the first couple of, couple of weeks for my onboarding, but a gardening accident just before I had to start my new job made walking really painful, so onboarding had to be done fully remotely, and it was so challenging. The tech stack was completely new to me. There was no documentation about anything. And after two full days of video calls, I just thought, like, no, that, this is ridiculous. There, there must be a better way. So I started documenting everything. I talked to people, I asked questions, I researched, and I wrote down everything. Once we had some documentation structured in somewhat comprehensive manner, people started contributing to documentation. Uh, back then, we still had a dev team in the UK, so we were also doing remote stand-ups. And somehow I got into the habit of doing this like more detailed updates every day online, and which turned out to be a really good thing. Because working remotely, it is hard to live work at work. It's like you're at home all the time. So how do you actually live work at work? So writing things down helped me to empty my cognitive load, or that all the information that I was holding in my brain. Then I could simply stop thinking about work, because I knew that I could just come back to my notes whenever I needed that information. It was my end-of-work ritual that helped me unplug at the end of the day. Writing also helped me to be more productive and prepare for the next day, because I already had all my to-dos for the next day. And when the whole dev team moved here to New Zealand, and we were no, do no longer doing these remote stand-ups, I kept this habit of taking notes, very detailed notes, every day. Just documenting everything I, I had done throughout the day, any to-dos for the next day, any things that I had to research so that I can look them up from my notes if needed. And I kept on building on this habit of writing. I started keeping a very low-level journal where I record the highlights and lowlights of my day, the things that made me happy, the challenges I had, like things I want to try out next, and so on. And this really helped me to become more mindful. It also helped me to identify some patterns. And there are some really, really clear patterns that emerged. I could really tell when I'm feeling stressed or tired for too many days in a row. I could notice what exactly are the things that are stressing me out. I could also notice what are the things that help me recharge. And now I make sure that I prioritize these things, the things that recharge me, so that I can do my job better. Making time for myself has become my number one priority. For me, this means swimming trainings, long walks with a good company, or going to art galleries. These are just some of the things that fill me in, and I make sure that I do them regularly. And through journaling, I realize how important prioritizing my well-being and prioritizing recharging is. Cool. 
Um, now I want to talk about some of the reports on remote work that have been published recently, which is not surprising um, that there have been so many reports. And I would like to share with you some of the findings from these reports that I can clearly re relate to. One of the interesting ones was um, Miro's survey on remote work. They found that over the last year, one third of the people that uh, took part in the survey reported that their mental health declined. P uh, many people were worried that their colleagues would uh, view them as unqualified, and people generally found it more difficult to provide positive feedback to their teams. So how do I counteract this? Journaling uh, has helped me to keep track of my mood and my accomplishments. So whenever I feel low, I could simply look at my notes and I can see how much of I have actually accomplished over the last week or the last weeks. And being able to see how much I have achieved, it makes it easier for me to remember and recognize the efforts and good work of my teammates. And I make sure that I provide this positive feedback to them. But journaling also helps me recognize when something really bothers me. And that's something really, really important to me. Because whenever I notice that something at work really upsets me or frustrates me, I just tell my team. I'm lucky that I work at a place where we value transparency and open communication. And I feel that I can be open about how I feel, no matter what it is. And I know that I will be heard. That's most important. I know that being honest about what bothers me will help it get it off my chest and will help resolve the issue. Because ultimately, I don't really want resentment to build inside me. Another interesting report published on remote work this year was the one by McKinsey and Company. They, as many others, believe that some forms of remote work will likely persist long after the virus is conquered, whenever that is. But they warn that remote work could create new psychological and emotional stresses among employees, including from isolation and loneliness. And this is not really surprising, because people are social creatures. And I know that if I rely on work for socializing, I will probably not thrive while I work remotely. Now, Luke leaves his friends in my home office every morning. But although they are cute, they don't really talk much. And so I make sure that I have enough social interactions throughout the work week. Luckily, I have the opportunity to chat to other parents when I pick up Luke from school almost every day. And every now and again, I also go out for lunch with friends. These are some small things that help me cope with the loneliness of remote work. Also, now is the time that I have to make an announcement, which was uh, part of the deal with Luke. I made with Luke so that I could use his photos in my presentation. So you see this monkey over there? His name is Monkey. And he's been missing for the last couple of weeks. And yeah, we haven't been able to find him anywhere. So if you see him somewhere, please let me know. Uh, Luke will be extremely happy. Yeah, end of announcement. Cool. Many of the studies on uh, remote work also report, report people working longer hours. And this is something that I can also relate to and I really struggle with. I know that this is also a common problem for uh, people who work at purpose-driven organizations. Because when you feel so inspired to do what you do, you might struggle with setting boundaries. And I know that setting boundaries is really important because it's actually the thing that will allow me to be more effective at my work. So working remotely, it's really easy for me to just tell, oh, I'll just finish this super small thing after hours, you know, like five minutes. And before I've realized the five minutes turn into hours, and I'm still working on something completely different, and yeah, it's not good. And having flexible working hours just makes things so much harder. Because usually I start working much earlier than workmate. my workmates, around 8 a.m., or even sometimes even earlier than 8 a.m. And even though I've communicated my working hours to, to my team, I still find it really hard to, to tell them that my workday is over when a meeting 
uh, runs over time or someone sends me a message in the late afternoon. And journaling actually helped me realize the negative effect of this, how stressful the end of my work days and how this stress carries over into my evenings and the time I spend with my family. So I've shared with my workmates how I struggle with setting firmer work-life boundaries, and they've been extremely supportive, encouraging me to prioritize my well-being, reminding me that it's time to check out, and ultimately helping me to hold, holding me accountable to keep my promise of finishing work on time. Knowing that I find it hard to tell people that my workday is over when a meeting runs overtime, I've made sure to block the 30 minutes of uh, the last 30 minutes of every workday in my calendar. I've also synchronized my calendar and Slack, um, Slack statuses. So now, whenever someone sends me a message on Slack, when it's almost the end of my work, work day, I don't feel like I need to respond immediately because my status is sent, uh, set to wrapping up my work day. And there's a Slack bot that sends them a message telling them, oh, Laura is about to finish working. So I just know, yeah, I can respond the next day. But yeah, basically, I'm using technology to help me set better boundaries. And I know that, I know that the most important thing actually that, that, that I actually did was to tell my team that I'm struggling with that because then they can support me. I know that if I set firm work-life boundaries and I tell them about it, they will be able to set firm work-life work boundaries as well and they'll be able to prioritize their well-being. I also know that when I work remotely, I'm, it might be harder for my team to see that I'm struggling because like, no, no one can actually see, see, see me. So unless I say something, they won't be able to support me and help me. And yeah, so I've learned that I need to be really proactive and to seek support when I need it. Because I do have my support network outside of work, but it's also good to know that my team has my back as well. So being mindful, adjusting my routine and prioritizing my well-being are the things that have helped me thrive while working remotely. So no matter whether you work remotely or in an office, don't let work affect your well-being. Be mindful, watch for warning signs, and make your well-being a priority. Thank you. I hope that this was helpful.